Right. I'll tell you a little story now. Back in 2014, in the October, I went down to Cardiff to pick Jeremy up. And he jumped in a car and he said, uh, what's going to happen next May, Mag? And I said, we're going to lose, Jer. He said, do you think so? I said, aye, of course we're going to lose. So he asked me why, what a stupid thing to do. <laughs> he was in the car with me for an hour and I told him why. <laughs> now, can you imagine if that had been a different conversation? Can you imagine if that had been, well, we're going to lose next May, Mag. What do you think's going to happen after that? And I said, well, Ed will resign and you'll get on the ballot with a minute to go and then you'll run the best campaign we've seen in a lifetime and you'll become leader of the Labour Party and the PLP won't back you and the following summer you'll end up touring the country again. By the time we got to Don Gwynlai, Cedar said, stop the car, I want to get out, you're a nutter. <laughs> But, yeah, he's not far wrong. Thank you for that, Ian. <laughs> but, um, at the time, we had brought him up to Merthyr Trade Union Council's Esso Davis Memorial Lecture because we knew that he was honest, he had integrity, integrity he was kind, he was compassionate. We just knew that this man was a good man. And the best thing that had happened since then is all of you now know that this man is a good man. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm Merthyr welcome to the, the democratically elected leader of the Labour Party. The Right Honourable, Honourable Jeremy Corbyn, MP. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. And can we start with a big thank you to Essex Fire Brigade Union coming here today to unveil this new banner. And I have to say the Fire Brigade Union have been fantastic in their help and support for everything that we're doing in this campaign. And I want to thank all of you for coming out here today because this at one level is a campaign about the leadership of the Labour Party, but it's also a campaign about our, our community, our society, our party, and our movement. And I stress the collective in this. It's our campaign for our communities and our movement. Yeah. And Merthyr is a place of the most amazing history and the most amazing struggle. And what I really admire is the way in which, despite all the difficulties, the artistic talent is here. The opportunities for theatre, dance, drama, art, poetry, music, everything is developing and continuing here because we are not just economic beings, we're also social beings, we're also people that want our children to grow up not being afraid of their own imagination and their own artistic and cultural spirit. And so when I was here some time ago, we did the S.O. Davis Memorial Lecture, and I was very proud to do that. And I've still got the gifts I was given at the end of it. Some of them I'm eating were Welsh cheese, some of them were jam, and one of them is a bottle of Welsh cider. And since I don't drink cider, it's standing there in all its glory and all its majesty for every visitor to my house to see. <laughs> so thank you all for coming here today. And... Uh, this square, of course, is the scene of uh, the massacre of 1831, the way in which the people of Merthyr rose up against unemployment, against reduction in wages, 
the way in which the military brought in to suppress that movement. What were those people protesting about? They were protesting about injustice. They wanted bread, they wanted homes, they wanted jobs, they wanted some security in their lives. When they were attacked by the military, one person, Dick Pendrin, was ultimately executed some time later. And many, many years later, a deathbed conversion, somebody admitted it was they who did it, not he. There is a campaign to clear his name. Let's support that campaign to clear his name. And Keir Hardy, of course, was the MP for Merthyr. Who can ever forget that? And who could ever not recognize the amazing contribution he made? A child laborer in mines in Scotland grew up to become a famed and fabled trade union organizer. Ultimately, the leader of the Labour Party, the first elected Labour MP, who not only was the MP for this town, but in many ways he was the MP for the oppressed in so many other places. He spoke up in Parliament at a time when few would have dreamt or dared to do so about injustices in South Africa, about injustices in India and Australia and in the United States. He traveled the world in search of peace. He worked so hard to try to prevent the First World War and work with socialist movements and trade unionists all across Europe to try to bring about a peace rather than the carnage that followed. And he said from the very balcony up there that we've just been to, and I quote, the ILP, that was the Independent Labour Party, has pioneered progress in this country, is breaking down sex barriers and class barriers, is giving a lead to the great women's movement as well as to the great working class movement. Keir was a man who said, you cannot liberate the working class unless you end discrimination on the basis of gender. Women should be treated equally as men and given the vote as equally as men. And so when Tyrone was talking, and I've known Tyrone ever since the minor strike, it was a privilege, a pleasure, and an honor to get to know him during the strike and the fantastic work that he and everyone else in Tower Colliery and all the other collieries did to try and protect the mining industry, destroyed as an act of political vandalism by the Tory government of the 1980s. And it was instructive for everyone that the inner city community that I'm proud to represent in Parliament collected money, food, clothes and everything else to send to the mining communities. And in return, the mining communities came to our inner city community. Both communities realized they were actually facing the same problem of an economic strategy which was about rolling back the state, rolling back the provision of communities, rolling back all that we had achieved and gained in favor of greater inequality, greater injustice, greater wealth for the few, and abysmal poverty for the many. That's what Thatcherism was. That's what austerity is. That's what neoliberal economics is. That is why we have to do things very, very differently. So at one level, this is an election for the leader of the Labour Party. And I'm very proud of the support we received last year and the way in which this campaign is already getting underway. We're traveling the whole of the UK. We're reaching out to every community in every part of this country. Yes, in order to take part in this election. Yes, in order to strengthen our party, but also to reach out to those who become disillusioned with politics because they don't see a political solution to their problems of education, of housing, of health, and all the other things, to bring people in, in the whole spirit and strength of a labor movement that unites everybody and doesn't blame minorities. So our campaign is about jobs. It is about investment. And when Ivan was talking earlier about the treatment of agricultural workers, I grew up in a farming community in the Midlands in Shropshire. And uh, in those days, it wasn't good. 
but there was an agricultural wages board covering the whole of the UK. It meant that at least there was a minimal condition for agricultural workers across the country. And by a lot of campaigning, we got rid of the tied cottage system and all that went with that. It's only in Wales that there is still an agricultural wages board. Well done, Unite the Union, for its work in support of agricultural workers. And all of us must realise that there can be poverty in rural areas, however beautiful and idyllic they look. When you're poor and you're living in a private rented accommodation with insecure tenancy, expensive rent, lack of bus services and all the other things that go with it, you are as poor as isolated as if you're living in a back street somewhere in one of our big cities or elsewhere. It's poverty we have to address. It's investment that we need across the whole country. And so there are campaigns that are so important. Tyrone and others were talking about the plight of the steel industry. We remember what Thatcher tried to do to the steel industry. We remember the jobs that were lost, the investment that was wasted, and the way the industry was run down. And now the dangers are all there again. So far as I'm concerned, the steel industry is a central part of the manufacturing economy of this whole country. And therefore, I've been very pleased to be able to work with those that work at Port Talbot to try and protect those jobs, protect the supply chain jobs that go with it. And say quite clearly this, it is the duty of a government, any government, to be prepared to intervene when an industry is facing troubles. We shouldn't allow our economic future to be argued out by distant global multinational corporations. It should be the responsibility of democratic governments to be involved in economic development and protection of those jobs. And then you look at the lack of investment that has taken place all over the country in former mining areas. Those areas that had that fantastic strength of community brought about by the miners' union, by the role of the miners' welfare, by the whole spirit of those communities. The mines might have closed, but it's pretty clear to me the spirit of those communities is there strong and demanding real political change in Britain. And if you look at injustices and inequality in employment practices across Britain, you need look no further than the former Shirebrook Colliery in Nottinghamshire. Shirebrook was a modern colliery, was fully unionised, had a multinational workforce who worked together, never blamed each other. They worked together to improve each other's conditions. Indeed, my friend, the great Dennis Skinner, worked in that very pit at one time. And... Dennis, by the way, is strongly supporting this campaign. And uh, what is it now? Sport Direct Factory, where there is a company that runs on behalf of Sport Direct, the process within the warehouse and within the facilities there. And the facilities there are absolutely disgraceful. And even the select committee report, all party select committee report, absolutely condemned them for the danger in the workplace, the systematic underpayment of workers, the zero hours contracts culture, the calling of ambulances because people couldn't get out of the factory to get medical, urgent medical attention when needed. Likewise, the number of fire brigade uh, incidents that have been called there to deal with safety in that factory. What is it about modern Britain that somehow or other we believe believe economic progress is best made by suppressing wages, worsening conditions and treating workers with no respect whatsoever. So I'm suggesting for a very start, any middle-sized reasonable company has got to negotiate with trade unions. We will repeal the Trade Union Act and we will bring about real positive rights at the workplace. Because those positive rights at the workplace are so important. It's about decency and respect within our society just as much as we will support the agency workers directive to prevent the exploitation of agency workers and the posting of workers directive amendments which will stop the importation of underpaid grossly exploited workers to undercut paying conditions that have been agreed in various countries it's about the issue of exploitation that we're agreed on and is so important 
But there is so much else within our society that is so important. Naren Bevan, MP, created the National Health Service. Personally, he gave everything to it. But in effect, he was a product of his time, his community, his place. He wanted a health service free at the point of use as a human right for everybody. And what we have now, yes, we have a National Health Service. All of us here rely on that National Health Service. But it's systematically underfunded across the UK. I admire the Welsh Government for abolishing prescription charges. I admire them for ending the ridiculous internal market within the National Health Service. And I congratulate them for that. But I say this, the underfunding of public services across the whole of the UK is a major problem. And the Health and Social Care Act that applies particularly in England means that 49% of all NHS, NHS services are out to privatisation. It's the systematic destruction of our National Health Service. If they're allowed to go on with this treatment of the NHS across the whole of the UK by a combination of punitive laws in England and underfunding in Wales and Scotland, then what do we end up with? Instead of the health service as the first port of call for all of us whenever we need medical help, it will gradually be leached away, private medicine will begin to take over, and instead of being our health service, will be like the remaining public health services in parts of the USA, will be a place of last resort when you can't afford to go anywhere else. Are we going to accept that or not? No, of course we're not. We have to be absolutely determined on the principle of a health service as a human right free at the point of use. But there's also an issue of the mental health services and treatment of people with mental health conditions across the whole of the UK. A quarter of us are going to go through a period of deep depression or crisis in our lives. Some of us will get through it because we've got understanding, loving partners, family, friends, community who reach out and help us understand what we're going through is a health condition that you can be helped through. Others will be frightened to talk about it. Young people in particular will often be very frightened to talk about it in school or college or university. And sadly, some of those will end up in a very difficult and very dangerous place. And sadly, some of those will even take their lives as a result of it. So we have to do two things. One is to change our language and our approach. If somebody's going through a mental health crisis, reach out and support them. Don't make jokes about it. Don't allow comedy in newspapers to take over on that and campaign for real parity of esteem real parity of esteem for those who need that support within the health service. The services that we want, the education we want, the decency we want, the housing and investment we want in our society comes from how we approach the major economic questions. A year ago, we lost a general election. We were all devastated by that defeat because we knew who was going to pay the price of that defeat. We knew it was the poorest people in the poorest communities that were going to pay the price of that defeat. We also knew that a short time later, the government would introduce a yet another welfare reform bill, and they duly did so, and another budget, and they duly did so. We knew what the Tory agenda was. But our problem was political. Yes, we fought the general election with some very good policies, no question about that. But the problem was we were still committed to a public sector pay freeze, and we were committed to continuing a reduction in public spending. You don't cut your way to prosperity. You invest your way to prosperity. And in the welfare reform bill, which came out last, just about a year ago, it came out, uh, was taking a further 12 billion pounds off the welfare bill, just as, as the Tories tried to take another four billion out of personal independence payments uh, this year. Sadly, the Labour position then was that we should abstain on this on the basis that the Tories had won the general election. I never understood the logic behind that, but maybe there wasn't any logic behind that. As far as I'm concerned, our job in Parliament 
is to stand up for the communities that have sent us there, to stand up for the kind of society that we want. And so when John McDonnell took on the role of Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, and I want to say a big thank you to John and his team for what they've already achieved. They came out with an early economic statement that was about changing from being a party of austerity to a party of investment and growth. Suddenly now, a year later, everybody agrees with John McDonnell. <laughs> They've obviously been listening very, very carefully to everything John has said, but they don't want to admit it. So let's help them understand it. John is a very intelligent person. His team are very clever and very intelligent. And they have simply worked out that if you have a problem of a shortage of housing in this country, you could leave it to the market, which would probably be quite happy if there was a permanent shortage of housing across the whole country. Because when there's a shortage of housing, you know what happens? Prices go up and rents go up and council housing gets sold off and becomes less available. So what you get is a bigger and bigger problem. What you get is more people sleeping on the streets. What you get is more children growing up in insecure, overpriced, damp, private rented accommodation, because some of those landlords are very bad, not all of them, and you get a shortage of council housing. If you decided instead, as a society, we believe everybody deserves somewhere to live, if we decided as a society every child deserves, deserves somewhere secure to live, what would be your solution? Would it be to say to the market, please be nice, please be nice, or would you intervene? Because if you invest in building, in converting, in retrofitting, and all those things in housing, as has been done in a lot of parts in Wales, then what you end up with is better housing, healthier children, achieving better in school, and going on to make a better contribution in our whole society. And you end up with jobs for construction workers in building those houses, and all through the supply chain. So it becomes a focus for economic growth, rather than a focus of poverty and misery. Quite simply, what we're proposing is to establish a national investment bank that will invest in infrastructure, will invest in housing, will invest in industry, and will invest in bringing about a better standard of living and a better society as a whole. So, when you expand the economy, you bring in more tax income, but there's another area we can look at, which we need to look at very carefully. The Panama Papers told us something about the attitudes of the super rich. They think tax is for somebody else, not for them. For them, it's the Cayman Islands, the British Virgin Islands, any one of these tax havens all around the world, and uh, they can then live off those um, that income they get from those places. I simply say to people, and to some of our media, and some of think it's clever to avoid paying your tax. One day, you might have a heart attack. One day, your property you might catch fire. One day, you might need the help of the police for some incident that's occurred to you. One day, you might need a public service to assist you to be taken into an A&E department. I want our health service to be there for everybody at all times. Therefore, I say to those people, and I say to our government, and I say that we will do this as a government, chase down the tax avoiders, chase down the tax avoiders, and chase down the tax havens across the world. Because that surely has to be the right way to do it. Our, um, our society is more unequal than it's been at any time in my lifetime. The level of income of the very richest is going up very fast. The proportion of income going to people in work is going down. The numbers of people that rely on in-work benefits in order to make ends meet is increasing. The number of people using food banks is increasing. The levels of desperate poverty and insecurity are increasing. Do we just ignore this and say it's one of those things about the market? Do we also then go on to say to our children, look, I'm really sorry, 
my generation did have uh, free university education across the whole of the UK. Sorry you won't get it. Sorry your grandchildren won't get it. And I'm really sorry about your great-great-grandchildren, but I won't be around to see the hardships that they are going to face. Can't we approach things in a slightly different way and start looking at the inclusion of everyone in our community? Look at the sharing of wealth rather than the agglomeration of wealth to the very wealthiest. And can't we look at the idea of how we treat the whole of the country? And so, you think back to the great achievements we made, how we obtained the vote, how women got the right to vote, the rights that we have, the health service we have, the trade unions we have, they all came because of people that were prepared to stand up with their community. What we're about as a party, as a movement, as a community, is people coming together to defend the good things, yes, but to extend them as well. And so this leadership campaign gives us that chance to extend out to all those communities that have been left behind in modern Britain, left behind by deindustrialization, left behind by market economics, and say that our responsibility is to bring people together. Our responsibility is to give real hope and real opportunity to everyone within our society, particularly our community, and no one is left behind. And say to those detractors, those detractors uh, of our party, and sadly some even within our party, a year ago in the general election our membership was 200,000. It's now reached 540,000 members of the party. And it's going up. And we have achieved electoral success over the past year. I wish we'd achieved more. We all wish we'd achieved more. But we are getting support. People are understanding that politics has changed. We're no longer the Me Tooism of the major parties accepting the politics of injustice, inequality and austerity. We are offering something very, very different. That is what's different about the politics today. And that is why this campaign and all the events we're doing is so inspiring. Free up our ideas. Bring people in so that we can live in a world where we want to sustain ourselves and sustain our environment and internationally be a force for peace, justice and human rights around the world and recognise we deal with the issues, issues of refugees and many other desperate people by a process of justice and human rights. This town gave us much inspiration. Keir Hardy founded our party. We are not about living in the past. We're about learning the lessons of the past of popular movements coming together, the struggles that brought them together, in order to bring about the decent kind of society that we all want to live in. And you know what? We're absolutely determined to achieve that and live in that world. Thank you very much indeed. Keep the red flag flying here. 